Okay, I got 9.30, so uh, we're going to do eschatology. So in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to explain everything with regard to the second coming of Jesus. And we're going to walk out of here knowing exactly when he's going to come. Maybe I'm stretching it just a bit. Anyway, we are going to look at eschatology. Uh, these have been brief overlooks, so don't expect to get all the answers. Uh, basically, I'm trying to have more questions than the answers necessarily. Um, we will start a new study next week. I'm not sure what, but uh, we'll start a new study. Um, I enjoy this, and there seems to be a group that, that does enjoy it. We'll try to get that out over Facebook, exactly what we're going to do. Um, we'll kind of rotate things around. We may, we'll probably do a book uh, next time, and we'll just uh, go through a book of the Bible. So we'll bring your Bibles next week. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us uh, so many things for us to, uh, uh, to learn and to, to get a glimpse of who you are and just how awesome you are. Uh, we realize that uh, the Bible is a, a tremendous book, but uh, as we consider your awesomeness, it cannot be contained in a book. And so if, as we think about the uh, the end of things, the end of time, um, again, uh, we can only read your glimpses and try to understand what that means for us today. So all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, eschatology. That's actually a big fancy word for how things are going to end. And so... Um, First passage is 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. Usually what we think about um, we think about eschatology. Oh, you think about the book of Revelation. And yeah, so why don't we start there? And the reality is that if it were just for the book of Revelation, we know very little, or it would be uh, it wouldn't be a complete story. Everything else has to, to fit in, which creates the issue. But anyway, 2 Peter chapter 3, 10 through 14. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will be will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. Uh, the earth and everything done in them will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godless, godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That's interesting. We can speed its coming in some way. Uh, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt the heat. Uh, but in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And so... In essence, what he is saying is that there is going to come an end to uh, this world as we know it, and it is going to be a tremendous end. Um, he, before uh, getting into the destruction here, he talks about how that uh, people leading up to this will say that it's not going to happen, that the earth has existed for so long, and he said, so it was in the days of Noah, and then the flood came along and wiped everybody out. And so we have an example of, uh, of judgment that are, has already taken place. And so now uh, he is promising this last judgment, which will come upon the, uh, the earth. Um, oh, so then, dear friends, since we are looking forward to it, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. This is the second time he has emphasized that because we know this judgment is coming, that we need to, to make sure that we're living a holy, blameless life at peace with God. All right, now we move into some terminologies that we've got to understand, and the first one is millennium. What is the millennium? In Revelation chapter 20, this is the only place that talks about the millennium. Um, and yet it has caused so much controversy. Um, and then I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key of the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. 
he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving nations anymore until a thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. So, this millennium is a thousand year period where Satan is uh, chained up. He's locked up. He is no longer, uh, he doesn't have influence as far, or in some way anyway, as far as the earth is concerned. There is something different about the influence of Satan upon the earth. Now, the question comes up, is this a literal thousand years? Uh, is it talking about something else? What is this millennium? And that's where people really get into questions. Uh, another thing with regard to eschatology that we know is going to happen is we know that the, uh, the second coming is going to happen. Jesus is coming back. And here are the two passages that refer to that. Uh, Acts chapter 10, this is as Jesus is going up into heaven. Uh, they looked intently up into the sky as he was going. And when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, men of Galilee, they said, uh, why do you stand looking into the sky? The same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. So basically saying Jesus is coming back. Uh, you saw him leave, he's coming back. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So, this is the uh, uh, Paul's picture as far as the second coming is concerned. This is where we hear the, uh, the when the trumpet calls, you know, when the rolls call up yonder, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. That's uh, where that the idea, the origin of that comes from. So, there's going to be a second coming. Jesus is coming back. And, uh, okay, and I tacked that on by, after that, we who are still alive are caught up in the air, the clouds meet him, and we'll go and be with the Lord forever. Okay, we come back to this passage. I didn't realize I put 16 on there. Uh, then, there's going to be a judgment day, back to Revelation 20. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, and the earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And then I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So, what's the problem? We know that things are going to end. Jesus is going to come back. There's going to be um, a judgment day, and everything's going to be done. Well, we do have problems. The uh, Second Thessalonians passage that um, we need to look at, this is a passage that Paul wrote in response to First Thessalonians because the people were all upset about what was going to happen. And so he writes, 2 Thessalonians says, don't, don't get all excited. This hasn't happened yet. Here's some things that are going to have to happen before. And so that's why we got to look at some of these things that are happening before the second coming at the end of time. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our uh, being gathered to him, uh, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be so easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching alleged from us, whether by a prophecy or by, uh, the, by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is uh, revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God and is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And don't you work or don't you remember that when I was there, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back. 
so that you may he may be revealed at the proper time. All right. So in this passage of scripture, what do we see that's got to take place before the end of time? Well, first there is a restraining force. There was something in Paul's day that was holding back uh, this stuff that was going to happen uh, before the end would take place. There was going to be a rebellion or apostasy. There was going to be a falling away as far as uh, the truth was concerned. There was going to be a man of lawlessness. And we, a lot of people ask, is this the same as the Antichrist? So, uh, of these terms, the restraining force is one that I don't hear talked about much. But I, I think it's kind of key to the whole mess. Uh, the rebellion or the apostasy. Uh, I think everyone has heard that, yeah, there's going to be a rebellion and apostasy. Um, and I get a lot of times people are looking for that right before the end of time. Man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, whichever term you want to use. I think they basically talk about the same person. But note how uh, this person is described in, in four. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called or called God and his worship. So that he himself is uh, up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Um, is there any, any ideas on who this is or what this is? Are you looking for an antichrist down the road? I know there were some people that thought Trump was the Antichrist. And before that, some people thought Obama was the Antichrist. So, if you become president of the United States, you're part of the Antichrist because we're the most powerful nation. And so you're setting yourself up. Hitler has been described, Nero, all these people have been described, even the Pope. And when you stop thinking about the Pope, what does the Pope say he is? He's infallible. So, anyway, this whole idea is interesting. But the Antichrist seems to be the thing that everybody talks about. Antichrist, Antichrist, Antichrist. Did you know that the word Antichrist is found nowhere in the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation does not use the term Antichrist in any way, shape, or form. Uh, where it's introduced is in John... 1 John chapter 2, 18. Dear children, this is the last hour, and you have heard the Antichrist is coming. Even now, Antichrist have come. This is how we know that it is the last hour. John says there are Antichrist coming, uh, or, or the, the Antichrist is coming. Uh, the man of lawlessness. It is important to note when we're talking about the book of Thessalonians and the book of 1 John, there is a major event that has taken place as far as uh, the world or as far as Israel is concerned. Does anyone know what that is? The destruction of Jerusalem. Um, Paul was writing before 70 A.D., John's writing after it in 90 AD. Paul uses terms like the last days. John uses terms like the last hour. And so there is a change. And so I think one of the keys to understanding the book of Revelation is to try to figure out at what point does the book or does the destruction of Jerusalem, where does it fit in to your eschatology or eschatological uh, views? Uh, with regard to the end of time. So, um, you know, that, that's why it becomes a mess. That's why it becomes hard for us to, to understand because of all these things. But note, he says there have been, there are already antichrists. And so this idea of one big antichrist, I'll go, on, go ahead and say it, I'll go on record. I think it's a figment of Christian's imagination there have been many antichrists. We've lived through many and we will live through many more. Unless we're lucky enough to be uh, at the end and, and we won't have to. Um, 
Another passage that is that has to be explained is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 15 through 18. According to the Lord's words, uh, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left behind the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord of the air, and so we'll be with the Lord forever. And uh, Paul in, in Corinthians talks about that time when the trumpet sounds will be changed in a moment because the, uh, the perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The idea of Jesus coming back, the idea of the second coming, the idea of the end is not something that has been given to frighten us, to freak us out. It's to encourage us. And, that, and I think that's important for us to understand. The idea of the second coming at the end of the world for the Christian is a time of rejoicing. We win. Or God wins. And we're just on his side. So, in this passage, some things that we have to you know, kind of come to an understanding. And that the first one is the coming of Jesus. Uh, it talks about the dead in Christ will be raised. Um, and so, you know, the bodies will be there and, and the, uh, the, the spirit of the body will be reunited again. C is a term that is nowhere found in Scripture, but again causes so much controversy, and that is the term rapture. Uh, the idea of the rapture is that Jesus is coming back and only Christians will be taken up. Only Christians uh, will be saved, and the rest of the world, the evil that's in the world, will stay for a period of time before the real second coming of Jesus is concerned. And so is the rapture uh, something that is real, or when he says the dead in Christ will rise first, is he simply talking about the dead in Christ will rise before those who are coming down, um, and it has nothing to do with the, uh, the evil, which also will be resurrected and taken for, for judgment at the same time. But uh, the rapture is the, the big deal uh, that people have. And, um, and, and we'll, we'll touch on it again. But is the rapture real? Is the rapture simply a, a figment of, of Christian imagination? Um, the idea will be taken to be with the Lord. That's clearly stated. And the purpose is to encourage. Yeah. Um, another passage that we're not going to look at, but it's Matthew chapter 24. And when you read Matthew chapter 24, and there's a parallel passage in Mark and Luke both, uh, it lays out for you to talk about there will be wars and rumors of wars and this and that will be taking place. It is important to understand that the disciples came to Jesus in verse 3. They were the ones who asked Jesus two questions. The first question, uh, Jesus had just said, that the, uh, the temple and Jerusalem were going to be laid uh, laid low. Not one stone will be left upon another. So the destruction of Jerusalem is, is talked about by Jesus just ahead of this. And so they come and ask Jesus, when will these things happen? The question is, when is the destruction of Jerusalem going to happen? And then, what are the signs of your coming and the end of time? To them it was the same thing. To them, it was the same event. But Jesus is answering two different questions. One is, when is the destruction of Jerusalem going to take place? The next question is, when is the end of time and the sign of your coming going to take place? And so that's the problem of, of Matthew 24, trying to decipher uh, which goes with what. And if you put the... Uh, um, things are going to happen in the destruction of Jerusalem with the end of time, then you can come up with all kinds of quirky things that the Bible says is going to happen at the end of time, which may or may not be so. But uh, 
one of the things that is known from church history is that when the destruction of Jerusalem came, there was no Christian left in Jerusalem. They read the signs, and which are pretty clear as far as when this was coming, especially the, uh, the abomination of desolation. Uh, when Antiochus Epimenes went in and, and offered a pig upon the altar in the name of Zeus in the temple of God, that was pretty much a sign that Jerusalem was done. And all the Christians scattered. And Jerusalem then was, uh, was destroyed. The next problem, as far as figuring out, is how we're going to interpret the book of Revelation. Is the book of Revelation uh, a warning, be ready, and the book doesn't apply to anyone until the end? Um, if all this stuff is going to happen just before the end, then the book of Revelation is nothing more than a warning that says, uh, man, you don't want to be here when all this stuff uh, falls into place and all this stuff happens. Or is it a warning that says life is going to be tough, but God's going to win in the end? So basically, your interpretation of the book of Revelation is going to depend upon your understanding of eschatology. Either the book of Revelation has absolutely nothing to do with you, with the possible exception of chapter 3, if we are in the Church of Laodicea, if we'll touch on that a little bit. Or um, is the whole book a picture of the entire church age? So, um, okay. Oh, I'm sure this is all muddled, but we're trying to, uh, you know, to get it all pictured, and um, we'll we'll have a discussion. I guess maybe we'll get through some of this. The millennial issue. You hear people talk about: Are you premillennial or postmillennial or amillennial? What does all that mean? And again, this is important to understand how you put everything in perspective. The post millennialist says that the thousand years of Christ will take place before the second coming. Which means that before Jesus comes back, there is going to be a period of a thousand years that Christ is going to reign upon the earth. Everything is going to be peaceful. The devil is going to be chained. The devil is not going to have any influence. And there is going to be a thousand year uh, glorious period upon the earth. It's interesting that one of the uh, the Restoration Church fathers, Alexander Campbell, was a post-millennialist. That's why he tried to, uh, you know, change the church in order that he might usher in. And when that happens, then you know, there's something supernatural to take place with it. But if Christ isn't going to come back, and something supernatural, there's going to be a literal thousand-year reign. Again, literal is the key. Um, I would say you would be hard pressed to find very many people who are post millennialists today. Uh, the idea that this world somehow is going to miraculously change without the intervention, or well, it has to be the intervention of God, but without Jesus coming back, um, and, and most people just don't see that taking place. Premillennialism is the primary view as far as. Christians are concerned. Premillennialism says that the thousand year reign of Christ will take place after the second coming. In other words, Jesus is going to come back to the earth, he is going to establish himself as king, and he is going to reign upon the earth for a thousand years. Satan is going to be bound, and he's not going to be able to have any influence uh, upon it at all. Until the very end, and then for some reason, he is released and place havoc as far as the world is concerned and then there's going to be the end but that is the the primary view uh, of most people and then amillennialism says that the uh, the church is the reign of christ and the second coming will come after but that will be the end in other words the church age is this uh, millennium it, it's not a literal thousand years it is simply uh, a picture of Christ reigning through the church here upon the earth 
And at the end of that period, when Christ comes back, that's the end, and, and it's all over. And so the, the question comes, uh, Christ is going to be, or Satan's going to be released at the end. That usually is a picture of uh, things getting bad toward the end, and just before Jesus comes back, period of tribulation, and you know, we're all going to have to go through it. But do you understand these terms? Do you know what you are, or, or you know, which what, which camp you fall in? And, but uh, that's what I'm saying. This is the uh, well, most of the things that you read, as far as the Book of Revelation are concerned, are written from the premillennial view. The Left Behind series is the premillennial view. The premillennial view has the rapture when G, you know Jesus goes back. Now it's before the real coming back. He comes back and takes all Christians out, and and then um, and then he comes back and establishes that thousand years with the ones he had taken before. Um, but that is the predominant view, and that's what you hear all the time. And people are constantly talking about the rapture. You know, one of um, I guess one of my spiritual heroes within the Church Christ Christian Church, Bob Russell, is a premillennialist. Um, I kind of, I, not, you know, I, I wish he were, let's put it that away, but, but he is. Um, I am not. I'm an amillennialist. I think that we are, uh, I don't think that there is going to be a literal thousand years. I think we are reigning with Christ right now. The church is the kingdom of God. And we may not be doing such a good job, but we are um, already saved. And Satan is, you know, in some way, is limited. When Christ died upon the cross, um, Satan lost, and he's a caged animal. And the only way that he, he is able to, to do any damage is if we get close enough to the cage. You know, you put a lion in a cage, but if you go put your head in the, in the uh, in the cage, it's going to rip your head off, which is what we do a lot of times as far as Satan is concerned. But does the Church of Christ have a stand on which one? Uh, Church of Christ does not have a particular stand because um, I would say for a long time, most Church of Christ preachers were amillennialists. Uh, I would say that the non instrumental, the acapella group, uh, most of them probably still are. Um, however, more and more kind of shifting toward the premillennial view. Um, and we are very, you know, very much in the minority. But I, but I would say that, that most preachers I know and associate with are, uh, are probably uh, amillennialists. Now, you have some premillennial differences because there is supposed to be, uh, if you, you know, in this interpretation, there's going to be seven years of tribulation. There'll be seven years where things are really, really bad upon the earth. And so, when does Christ come back and take the church out? Okay, um, the pre-trib premillennialist are the ones who believe that the second coming comes before the tribulation. That, I think, is the majority view. And that would be the, the, the view of left behind. The idea is that things may be bad, but as far as the real tribulation is concerned, it doesn't happen until the church is taken out. And so what does that mean for you and me? You know, the, you, know you always hear, if we're in the last days, and we're going to live through this tribulation, how horrible it is. If you're a pre-trib, pre-millennialist, what does that mean with regard to you and the tribulation? You're not going to have to go through it. Because Christ comes that down and takes you out ahead of all that. So the book of Revelation has absolutely nothing to do with you because most people believe that the rapture takes place at the, if there is a rapture and a premillennial then it takes place at the end of Revelation chapter 3. So the rest of the book of Revelation has absolutely nothing to do with the Christian...
premillennialist view. Now there are mid-trib premillennials, and they say that yes, there's going to be seven years, the church is going to have to go through the first three and a half years. But in the middle of this tribulation period, Christ is going to come, take the church out, and then the rest of the world is going to go through three and a half more years of intense persecution. And then the uh, the bottom view, which I don't like at all, is the, uh, the post-trib, which says that uh, the church has to go through all seven years of it. Jesus comes down, takes the church out. Uh, they have a party. At the end of the party, then he comes down and uh, takes the uh, uh, you know takes the the world into that thousand year reign. That is one year. One of the big issues I have with this view of uh, the premillennial view that Jesus comes back, establishes a thousand year is I do not understand why, and I don't understand everything about God, but this is one that I don't, um, why God would release Satan at the end of a thousand years. Uh, I don't see anywhere in Scripture other than you know this Revelation 20 passage where anything like that is even talked about. But, uh, you know, so... Those are the differences as far as the premillennial views are concerned. Um, and it does affect your view of Revelation. If you are a premillennialist, then you believe that the book of Revelation is literal, which means that John saw exactly what was going to happen. He, the doors were open and he saw actual events, but he could not... Uh, you know, how would you, if you were John, describe uh, a tank? Never seen a tank. Uh, you know, especially when it's shooting out fire. And, and so he is using first century wording to describe 20th or 21st century technology, or 22nd or 23rd, whatever, it's all going to happen. And so the pictures that we have are symbolic, but he, but it's literal because John actually saw uh, what's going to take place and what's going to happen. And again, that makes for neat stories because you have the uh, the cobras, the uh, you know the, the tanks, the, the jet fighters. Uh, the only place, an interesting thing, um, if you're a premillennialist. You're hard pressed to find the United States in the book of Revelation. And when you're talking about a world war on the scale of this, it's just hard pressed to find the United States. A number of explanations have been given. One is that the United States has collapsed and is no more. Um, we won't go there. Uh, but if you have the church being taken out, I can see that, that the, uh, you know, if all of a sudden the Christians would disappear from the from America, what would America be like? Bad enough now. Even if we are doing a, you know, a job as, as well as we could. Um, the other thing, uh, there are a number of other issues as to why America isn't there. Um, might not be there, might not be in the book of Revelation. There does appear, uh, I read one book where it said, the only place in the United States that talks about the remnant of Israel being taken out on the wings of angel or the wings of eagles in the United States with the eagle on the side of the airplane and comes in and rescues the Jews. The other thing with regard to premillennialism, it goes back to the Jews. Once the church is raptured, the people of God are no longer the church. They're the Jews. Okay. And for the most part, premillennialists, for the most part, the book of Revelation is chronological. Most believe, or at least in pre-trips anyway, that the church and Christians will be secretly raptured after chapter 3. And most identify uh, this period as the church of Laodicea. The only part of the book of Revelation that uh, applies to uh, the church today is whatever church age we're in. Uh, the first three chapters of the book of Revelation are talking about 
uh, the letters to the seven churches. Okay? Uh, Premillennials, everything else is literal, but these seven letters aren't literal. These seven uh, letters to churches are actually representations of seven church ages. There are periods of time that the church goes through, and that's before the end. And so the only thing that the church deals with is, is wherever we are on that, that timeline and whatever church we're in. Most would identify this as the Laodicean period, which is church seven, or leading up to, to the very end. And so, um, you know, so you have the book of Revelation being divided into um, chapters one through three as 2,000 years. You have the book, or chapter four through 19 talk about seven years. You have chapter 20 talk about a thousand years and then 21 and 22 for all eternity. Um, I personally do not like that interpretation because it's, you know, it seems like it's zeroed in on seven years, which none of the people who read it were going to be a part of. It seems to be seven years that's only going to be applied for those who are in that seven years. And if you're a Christian, you're going to get raptured out. You're not even going to be a part of that seven years. And so, if you really boil the book of Revelation and how you interpret it, um, I think the premillennial view has a, has a tough way uh, of really fitting in. That's my opinion. Amillennial's view, uh, Revelation is symbolic, but John wrote exactly what he saw, literal. So here's where, you know, the, the idea, who is more literal, who is more symbolic? John wrote exactly what he saw. If he said, I saw a scorpion, he saw a scorpion. If he saw a red horse, he saw a red horse. That was symbolic of something else. But he, what he wrote was literally what he saw. So which is literal, which is symbolic? Um, so the literal symbolic argument that goes back and forth between the amillennialist and the premillennialist, to me, is, is mute. Amillennials view Revelation as a series of pictures, perhaps seven, I can find seven for you, that run from John's day until the end, and so that we are living in the book of Revelation now. The first three chapters are uh, the seven churches, and so it spans the entire church age, not in consecutive order, but all through the church age, there are going to be all seven of these churches. And you may have been a part of two or three of these different kinds of churches. And there are all kinds of these churches around. And so it is a picture of the entire church age. And so then you go to the, uh, the seven seals, goes from the beginning to the end. If you look at the end of all of these, they end very similarly. They end at a climactic moment before the throne or in heaven. And so I think that there are just seven pictures that go from the, John's day until the end. And so basically he's saying, you guys are in the book of Revelation. Here's seven different pictures of what you're going to have to go through. Here's seven different pictures uh, of God's dealing with man upon the earth. And what you got to look forward to is going to be the end. Revelation 20, or you know, chapter 20, which is the millennium, is one of those pictures. It is a picture of the thousand years or the church age. The end is going to be uh, more intense, and then it's going to be the end and judgment. But there are seven pictures uh, that are in the book of Revelation, so we're in the book of Revelation now. I like that interpretation. It's not as fancy. Because you're not looking for all these these specific events that are going to take place. But there have been all these things over and over and over. When you think about COVID and COVID-19, is it one of the plagues in Revelation? Is it one of the plagues that's talked about as far as the end of time is concerned? Someone said earlier or told me you know, in, in the foyer, you know, I'm sure people that went through the black plague wondered the same thing. There have been all kinds of these things throughout the church age 
Why are they there? Why do they happen? Why does God allow them to happen? Because he's trying to draw us back to him. And so, to me, that's why I'm on the lens, because it, it just seems to have a, a, a much better picture of what the book of Revelation is all about. But here's the bottom line. The bottom line from a standpoint of what you have to believe if you're going to get to heaven with regard to the book of eschatology, or as far as eschatology is concerned. This is the bottom line. You've got to believe this. Jesus is coming back, and we're not going to be able to figure out when. I suppose you want to figure out when you'll still go to heaven. But uh, Jesus is coming back. That's promised. That's clear. Secondly, there's going to be a final judgment. We're not going to stand before God. He's going to open a book. Name's in a book. Good. Name's on the book. Not so good. The saved are going to spend eternity with God. And the unsaved are going to be separated from God. You could be an amillennialist. You could be a premillennialist. You could be a pre uh, pre pre a pre or a pre trip post trip mid trip. You're going to be a post millennialist. All these people it, that has nothing to do as far as salvation is concerned, because we don't know. But something is going to happen, and when it happens, then we're going to know. When we get to heaven, it's going to be fun to talk about. You know, I used to think such and such. No, it was I stupid. Two more views. One is a pan millennialist. The pan millennialist believes everything will pan out in the end. I haven't got a foggiest clue. It's all going to pan out in the end. The other is the pro millennialist. Doesn't know when, doesn't know all the what's, but he's all for it. And, and those are probably a couple of the, uh, of the best views that you have. Okay, any questions or, or comments? Again, this is a brief overview. This can be so confusing for the average person, especially a young person, that uh, you can understand why we have 200 versions of Christianity because it's very confusing. If we could have one simple message where we could all unite about it, it would help our cause greatly. The, I think the most important thing with regard to, the, to eschatology is the fact that we we don't get so dogmatic in our view, and I probably I'm probably inching toward being dogmatic about the online of view more than I necessarily should. I can get excited about it, but, but because you know I start seeing things fall into place. But as far as new Christians are concerned, you know, to me it goes back to the bottom line: Jesus is coming back. There's going to be a final judgment. The saved are going to go to heaven. The uh, the unsaved are not going to go to heaven. And how it all plays out, let's not get so excited about it. Let's just be excited that Jesus is going to come back and, and you know, like uh, you see on Facebook a lot, um, you know, I've read the last chapter, we win. And so when we get into, as we grow in maturity, where we want to take on these heavier subjects and, we, and these meatier subjects, that we act mature enough that when we study it, that we only study it with mature people and, and we can discuss differences and not alienate each other. And, and so that's the, uh, that's kind of the picture that we need to see. And, and be careful, you know, it's just like, you know, uh, if I would go over to Josh Akiki's and pick up Braxton and try to give him a, a, a chunk of beef to eat, that'd be stupid. He's going to choke on it. And that's a lot of times what, what uh, Christians do. Uh, and it, a lot of times it's young Christians. Because we've made the study of Revelation so so exciting. Um, when I study the book of Revelation, the way I understand it, it's a pretty boring book. There's just a whole lot of bad stuff going to happen. We're going to have to go through a whole lot of bad stuff. There's not anything we can do to stop the bad stuff because there's a lot of bad people in the world. And someday God's going to come back and, and take care of it all. And you want to have your name written in the Book of Life, and if it's there, good. Um, 
something. So like I say, that could be boring. But when you spice it up with all these things that are going to happen, but when you do that, you, you, I mean, that's the thing. If you are a premillennialist, you've got to understand that you're talking about the book of Revelation from chapter 4 to chapter 19, talking about the seven years of tribulation. That's where it is. That's what it talks about, and that's all that it talks about. And so that's, you know, he took 22 chapters, and he spent 15 of them talking about things that, that don't affect you, don't affect me. Um, if I were doing that, I would do it differently. But anyway. It is a fascinating study. It is interesting to, to think about these things. And people get all excited about it. And we ought to. But, uh, you know, not so much from a standpoint of we're right or wrong, but the idea that Jesus is coming back and we don't have to worry about this stuff. And if we could figure out, you know, when it talks about and hasten these things, Jesus, or, or Peter is saying, God is waiting because he doesn't want anyone to perish. The reason he's waiting is because not everybody that's going to be saved is saved. And so we can help him out by being more evangelistic and getting out there and saving those people, or not saving, but bringing those people to salvation. That's what he means. Our evangelism is going to bring about, and I think um, Campbell just went one step too far with that. He thought that, you know, uh, that we could usher in a millennium you know, I don't think any type of revival is going to rush you know, bring about a millennium. And I don't know why. I don't know why God's waiting. I don't know why he hasn't you know, come back. There was enough bad stuff that I would be you know, so anxious to come back and slap some people around. You know, I, I'd have had Jesus back here already. But God's patient. God's loving. But much more loving and much more full of grace than I am. And that's why he waits. And that's why we go through. Because there are people out there he wants as many people as can be saved to be saved. Okay. Next week we'll start a new study and we'll get that out on Facebook and let you know. Heavenly Father, we we do thank you for the encouragement that is in your word. Even the book of Revelation, Father, the, the pictures of of things that Christians have to go through. But the reality is, even as we're going through, you're with us, you're watching over us, you're taking care of us, and that someday we're going to be able to go and spend eternity with you. Father, may we long for that. May we pray for that. May we pray for the quick return of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.